saying what has oh we've just got the notice that we're recording so what has kicked off this event is the quite appalling practice that allows the imprisonment of people seeking asylum. Uh, early this year, Amnesty released our report, Please Take Me to a Safe Place, highlighting the significant harm that has come and is coming from this policy. And something that uh, we were reflecting on just before we joined was that um, you know this has been an issue and this has been something people have been campaigning and advocating on for many, many years and, and in fact decades. It's a, a practice contrary to international human rights law. It's a practice that has caused indescribable harm. Uh, I mean, in positive news, the government uh, announced earlier this year that there's going to be an independent review into the practice, which and that review is currently underway. However, until change is over the line, we need to keep the pressure on. So that brings us here to tonight. So the way we're going to run tonight is we're going to start with a question to our wonderful panellists about what it's like to seek asylum and have a deeper look into this uh, current practice that allows for the imprisonment of people seeking asylum. And then we're going to move on to what's that future, that positive future that we're trying to build and the change we want to see. And then we'll open the floor to questions. But at any point, if you have a question, please pop it in the chat and we're going to try and get through as many as possible in the time that we have. So I wanted to kick off now with our first question. So that's looking at what it's like to seek asylum and looking and really diving deep into that policy that allows for the imprisonment of people seeking asylum here in Aotearoa, New Zealand and the impact of that. I'd like to uh, start with Bernard. So Bernard is heavily involved in the refugee sector here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Mm -hmm. He's currently the chair of the Asylum Seeker Support Trust. And Bernard is currently a doctoral candidate looking at the mental wellbeing and the refugee status determination procedure here in Aotearoa. So kia ora Bernard, thank you again for coming along and mm -hmm. over to you. Kia ora Lisa and thank everyone who is here today, more especially Amnesty International for organizing this um, event. Um, it's actually been very grateful um, and I feel very honored as someone, as someone who's come from the background of having claimed asylum in New Zealand and was recognized as a refugee. And then after uh, many years here, looking back at the process and just getting a sense that, um, you know, there are some aspects of the process that don't feel quite right for a country like New Zealand. So um, your question that, um, what is it like to seek asylum? It's, you know, I can go on and on on, on that because, you know, having had the lived experience and also doing um, research in this area, there are just so many um, um, telling stories that, you know, I could talk on, but, more importantly for, for many of us who are asylum seekers and having come from background where um, we've experienced either wars, conflicts or uh, persecution, it's always um, our expectation of claiming asylum, it's quite different from what we experience going through. Because if you think about, for instance, like someone like me who comes from Africa, more particularly from Cameroon, in a country where we have a government that would, you know, abuse, torture, arrest, detain, and even kill you just for speaking up on some of the things that are just quite normal, like in New Zealand, like what we see today, where the government has uh, a perspective, for instance, on how COVID could be managed. Whereas, you know, many people are following that. We also have a, a segment of the population that thinks differently and even goes out to protest you know, against this kind of policies. These are just some of the very basic things that if you come from a background, my background, like the country where I come from, doing that sort of things can be the reason for which you'll be killed or you, the military will move in and arrest those people that went out to protest and all of that. So um, coming from that background and being here in New Zealand, um, sort of we expected that the government will have that understanding of the torture and some of the experiences that we've gone through and just sort of have a fair process. And when I mean fair, I'm talking about um, like procedural fairness in the sense that um, 
It's a process that treats you with that understanding of where you're coming from and what you've been through. But actually, when some of us do end up like in prison and being detained or locked up just for claiming asylum, not for any other reason, not because we have committed a crime, that in itself can be very, very um, uh, dehumanizing and in itself very torturing. And for many of the people who have been through that experience, it's even worse than the conditions that they've explained that they have escaped from because they've never, in the countries where they've come from, some of them may never have gone to prison, even though they may have experienced um, persecution or seen a war that was coming or conflict and then they escaped, but they have never had that experience of being in an actual prison and living with people who are regarded by society as criminals or who may have actually committed a crime. So yeah, this these are just some of the things that for us are very, very, um, I would say, not good for, for a country like New Zealand because we, we expect more. And um, even more importantly, when I talk about um, procedural fairness, um, I know we have a very um, rich panel here, more especially Deborah with uh, a good knowledge in that area. But from my layman's perspective or uh, you know, or someone who's doing research in that area, what I see when I look at our laws on the paper, we have, you know, our Immigration Act actually provides very good um, uh, uh, procedure for refugee status determination. For instance, on that procedure, procedural fairness, we have like the evidence rule. So, and and the law sort of allows for that. We have um, the the right uh, the right to be heard. I know, and the law also in the, in the act, it allows for that and the right to provide evidence to support your case. So all these things, if you look at our act or the law as it is in, in paper, it's quite clear and really well um, stated. But unfortunately in practice, when we come in and then claim asylum and then you end up in prison, for instance, or even sometimes even at the Mangare Detention Center, it becomes now a question of whether are uh, those things that have been stated by the acts, you know, the law, which in a country, one thing I really like about New Zealand is that the law in this country is so strong that, you know, everyone, you know, obeys the law. And it, it's for me coming from a country where they, we don't, a lot of our problems come because we don't respect the law and being here and seeing how we sort of obey the law and respect the law. I am really very happy to be here, but I get, saddened when I look at how asylum seekers are treated to an extent in a way that I think clearly there is a culture there that disregards this, this law, these things that have been stated. Because there is no way possible that the people that work in this space can justify that putting someone in prison actually gives them that right to evidence. Because how do you gather evidence when you are in prison and there's no means to do that? either locked up in a, in a security prison, or how do you have a right to speak to a lawyer when the lawyer can have to go through so many processes to be able to see you in prison. And when the lawyer sees you, the only, that lawyer only has maybe a limited period of time to be there with you and the lawyer is out. So it, clearly these are things that in itself sort of makes a mockery of, of, of our laws as a country. So the law in, on paper for me looks good, except there are some areas like if you look at, the warrants of fitness, um, sorry, the warrants of um, commitment procedure, it's questionable, but in, in many other areas, the law is quite good. Sorry, I don't want to keep, keep on going long as I understand we have a, a rich panel of speakers, so I might leave it there and, and then follow up later if there are any questions or things that I may need to add. But before I go, sorry, Lisa, there, there are two other things that I think is quite important for this Corey Road that we're having. What we do experience, or from my experience, and besides that being a researcher, is that what we come through and experience in this country is because we have this culture that sort of governs how this process, you know, the culture of the people that work in this refugee status determination, they come from a background where there is a culture of disbelief. So, and what that means is that if you come in as an asylum seeker and you're going through this process, everything or most of the things that you put, put in to prove your case, which the law says that the, the burden is on you, the claimant to prove your claim, 
those offices that process the claim disbelieve you. And that's why for someone, when sometimes they say, I have an ID or this is my ID card or, you know, these are things that I can use to establish my ID. They end up in prison because the officer simply does not believe them. And be behind that culture of disbelief is another culture, which is the culture of deterrence or punishment. We believe that, you know, everything that we go through during the process of refugee status determination and ultimately even when we are recognized, some of the entitlements that we have that have been stated in the law we struggle a lot to assess them as people from this background is because the, the system, there is a systemic kind of structure that makes it really hard for us, you know, in a way that life for us becomes miserable. So that if someone was to call me, for instance, from Cameroon or any other part of the world and say, oh, I want to come to New Zealand, you know, how is life there? The first thing I'll tell them is that, bro, don't come here, your life will be miserable. So by treating us poorly there, using us as a means to deter other people that could potentially come. Sorry, I thought I'd point out these two important issues. So, yeah, thank you, Lisa, for that. And, and that's it for now, <laughs> sorry. Thank you, Bernard. And um, please don't know if you're rushed, your um, some really powerful insights and words there. And I think um, it'd be great to hear more about that, particularly in the, in the question time and as we go on. So thank you so much for your ins your insights and um, we wanted to share those insights. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to pass over now to Yulia, who, as I mentioned earlier, is a lecturer in political science and international relations uh, here in Wellington. Uh, and she's also worked previously in a range of academic roles overseas and has a general uh, interest in citizenship and migration, including minority rights, statelessness, and forced migration. Uh, Yulia also has a decade-long experience in, um, as a civil society and human rights activist, working with marginalised minorities and migrants in Europe. So kia ora, Yulia, and uh, thank you for being here, and over to you. Uh, kia ora koutou katoa. Uh, can everybody hear me very well? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm really happy, honored and humbled to be here today uh, to be part of this conversation also especially because it's my first uh, public uh, talk after my son has been born three months ago so I'm very happy to uh, be uh, here and I'll see if I still know how to <laughs> talk and deliver messages. So what I would like to talk about today uh, is putting asylum in this global world politics uh, uh, context. But before I start, I usually, when I teach uh, the politics of forced migration and also human rights classes, when I introduce myself and when the students ask me where I'm coming from, I usually start sweating because um, I have to say that I'm originally from a country that doesn't exist anymore. That is former Yugoslavia that has been devastated and destroyed by uh, quite um, uh, like the last uh, big war in the center of uh, uh, Europe and there are 4 million people displaced. I was very lucky that it was a part of former Yugoslavia that is today Slovenia, it hasn't been so affected by the war. We only experience uh, uh, a brief um, period of war, a few weeks. So we have been very lucky and we didn't have to flee from the place where I was at. However, I was uh, uh, basically uh, away from my brother extended family for uh, five years because of uh, the war in former Yugoslavia. Anyway, if I go back to uh, what um, I teach and basically what I want to do today, you will hear from many fantastic speakers, including Bernard, who really presented what's the issue with uh, asylum seeking in New, Ze New Zealand. Thank you very much, uh, Bernard. Um, what I want to say is that from the beginning, when uh, the right to seek and enjoy asylum became a, a right written in the Universal Declaration of uh, Human Rights in 1948, I argue that it has been having a troubled history in the world politics. Uh, so in 48, uh, when it became uh, basically the uh, human right and the And when the states were discussing how to actually introduce uh, the rights of refugees, the rights of asylum seekers, uh, many times uh, at the UN, the discussion was in the tone like the helpless state are trying to protect themselves. And I'm quoting here from Wicked 
refugees, as if the refugees are the ones who are uh, actually somehow endangering the states, which we know that is not the case. And we also saw that uh, later on, that asylum has been used in the world politics by the states uh, wanted to get domination on the world stage. For example, uh, uh, the, in uh, the Hungarian revolution, many states uh, accepted 200,000 Hungarians uh, who uh, fled because of the Hungarian revolution in 56 and 57. And also, for example, Australia uh, accepted 70,000 uh, Vietnamese refugees, all in this world uh, dual world order and so on. Um, after the end of the Cold War, there was somehow watering down of asylum uh, system with introduction of many different statuses uh, that do not lead to, to the full uh, refugee protection as we see in the, in, the, as we saw in the Yugoslav wars. And especially what is very relevant, what we call in, uh, in uh, basically migration studies, uh, something happened that is called crimigration. Uh, so that uh, many times the uh, refugee law and migration law is somehow conflated with criminal law, which is really problematic. And uh, that was the troubling development also with offshore uh, system that uh, systems that we had in Australia and somehow now states like the UK and Denmark are copying this. Uh, and as we saw, as you showed very well in the report and uh, what Bernard also said in his uh, speech, it is a problem, the tension is a serious problem and it should not be happening in the way it's happening in uh, New Zealand. But what I would like to uh, actually, uh, um, what I would like to sh uh, uh, basically add here, even if the conditions, so the report showed that the conditions are quite terrible uh, for asylum seekers in uh, prisons here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, but even if the conditions were perfect, it still would not justify uh, asylum seekers being put in prisons with other, uh, uh, with prisoners who have been uh, through certain criminal procedures and so on. So even if like nothing like what uh, uh, actually was happening uh, like this, it would still be a problematic practice because it actually conflates uh, uh, this criminal uh, law with uh, uh, basically migration law and somehow treats migration as such as a crime and especially uh, all the international uh, documents from the, for example, from the uh, Refugee Convention say that asylum seekers should not be treated as uh, criminals and the fact they, ha they had to flee, which meant they sometimes did, for example, irregularly cross the border or there are certain documents that uh, are not in place that it should be. However, when you're fleeing something, you should not be treated as a criminal in any uh, respect and that's the problem that is happening happening in many states. But what I think it's a positive news is that New Zealand actually has a, an opportunity here to actually set the world stage of global politics and asylum uh, to uh, somehow um, say, okay, there is a different practice possible. That is that not uh, that also asylum seekers are uh, treated fairly, not just uh, refugees uh, who refugees who come through the quota system who were once asylum seekers but they did not seek asylum in uh, uh, New Zealand uh, uh, at the first instance. So in the end what I would like to just conclude uh, and I'm happy to discuss this more just not to take too much time. Uh, I would just like to conclude even if uh, the report showed that all the everything is perfect for uh, asylum seekers in prisons it would still be a problem that asylum seekers are put uh, in prisons. So uh, I would like to conclude here, but very happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Yulia. Really helpful also to have that international perspective in there. So just for those who have just joined us, uh, we've just started with our first round of questions to our panelists. And we're looking at uh, what it's like to seek asylum in Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, the issues there, and in particularly looking at the impact and problems with the policy that we currently have in this country that enables the imprisonment of people seeking asylum. So I'm now going to hand over to Deborah. So as I mentioned earlier, Deborah is a barrister specialising in human rights law, including refugee and immigration law. She is currently a member of the Auckland District Law Society Refugee and Immigration Committee, executive member of the Refugee Council of New Zealand, and executive member of the Human Rights Foundation. So kia ora Deborah, and thank you for joining us tonight. 
Kia ora koutou. Thank you very much, um, Amnesty International. Thank you for asking me to be on the panel. It's always a privilege and a pleasure to do anything with um, Amnesty International. Um, I'd like to acknowledge Ming Foon, who's here, our Race Relations Commissioner. It's, it's a real privilege also to have you along with us. And I would also just like to acknowledge everybody here from civil society um, to discuss the issue of um, de the detention of refugee claimants or asylum seekers. And thank you to Bernard for um, standing off with the lived experience and to Yulia for the international global perspective. Um, I'm very much a working lawyer in this area and um, perhaps I'll just ground us um, in terms of where New Zealand is at in terms of um, the detention of asylum seekers and just provide some um, a framework for that. Um, so I think the first starting point is that New Zealand is a signatory to the United Nations Refugee Convention um, that enshrines at international law that um, everybody has the right to seek asylum and that is now part of our domestic law, it's been incorporated into the Immigration Act. Um, of course, the snag is you can only exercise this right to asylum once you're on shore in New Zealand. And so I would endorse what Bernard has said, which is that New Zealand has a deterrence policy, which is that we spend a lot of effort, energy and money trying to ensure that people don't actually get to New Zealand to be able to exercise that right to claim asylum. And so um, if people do come and claim at the border and they come without documents, those are the, those are the people most likely to face detention. Um, so we've got the Refugee Convention that is part of international, the International Human Rights Framework, part of New Zealand domestic law. And there's an important article in that, Article 31, which specifically says that no refugee should be penalised for travelling on a false document. And that's very important because it's been recognised from the very beginning um, of this convention, um, 1951, after World War II, that refugees often have to travel with false passports. Um, the country of origin won't often give um, dissidents uh, travel documents um, in which to travel on. But entering New Zealand without a passport or on a false passport is a key reason why people are detained in New Zealand. So the other important piece of information is to understand there are two types of um, ways people can enter New Zealand uh, as refugees. One is under the quota system. This discussion does not concern the people coming through the Mangere Centre under the quota category. This discussion concerns people who arrive in New Zealand and then claim asylum on shore. Um, there are two main government ministries or departments involved in this issue, which is important to um, be aware of. The first is, the, uh, is Immigration New Zealand, and the second is the Department of Corrections. It's Immigration New Zealand that decides whether or not people should uh, be detained but it's the Department of Corrections that are responsible for the appalling conditions and the suffering that um, refugee claimants experience when they're held in detention. By and large, I would say the main people who are being detained are those, as I said, who arrive at the border without identity documents. Um, and so that they're often young men, um, young to older men from particular um, regions, often um, from the Mishrek or the Maghreb. Um, um, family groups tend to be allowed through and um, women do tend to be allowed through but that said it's not uncommon for there to be um, uh, asylum seekers in, in women's prisons. Uh, once people are detained at the border they are then um, they have a, a short number of days in a police cell often um, which are incredibly degrading experiences for asylum seekers. They um, find it very hard if not impossible to contact lawyers up in the Mount Eden remand prison, um, again mixing with a remand population. Um, and this is an incredibly um, harsh environment. I, I would characterise Mount Eden prison as a hellhole. Uh, and this has been going on for well over 20 years. When I first um, started working in this area back in 1999, um, we uh, had wholesale detention of asylum seekers because of um, a big international conference, APEC. Bill Clinton was coming to play golf and then all of a sudden New Zealand was on high security and all asylum seekers were being detained at the border. Before then it had been um, much more ad hoc and people were given visas at the border. Following um, the APEC experience of 1999, and of course there are people in, in this um, call here 
who were around during the first Gulf War, which was the first wave of wholesale detention of asylum seekers. So that was the first wave. Then things settled down, people were given visas. Then the second wave was 1999 APEC. And then the current policy really became entrenched after the 9-11 um, attacks. And so those 9-11 attacks were really um, the license, if you like, for immigration officials to embed this deterrence policy to be able to justify needing to detain asylum seekers on the grounds of security because the world went into um, what was called then a red light um, alert system for um, security for New Zealand. And so then that led to essentially um, standardised detention of asylum seekers who turned up without passports and so on. Uh, so over the last 20 years, it's hard to believe it's been 20 years since then, um, that the, the operational policy that was created basically hasn't changed. And as Bernard said, on paper, it looks very good. There's an immigration admin policy that says that essentially um, the decision to detain is discretionary. It's the lowest level of detention possible. It's continuously reviewed and so on. But in practice, the immigration officials hold all the cards. Um, because it's incredibly difficult for asylum seekers to actually get their cases individually considered by the district court due to systemic dysfunctions involving um, access to justice because of a lack of legal aid and also because of deficiencies in the district court um, process. My view view is that um, the Immigration Act actually would allow proper um, review of detention, but there are systemic deficiencies that uh, mean that that is not occurring, and Amnesty International really brought that out in, in their report, and I, I commend you for that. Um, one thing I would like to also say, as well as the Mount Eden stream, there, the Mangari um, Centre is also used as a detention facility for asylum seekers. Um, this has been the subject of quite a bit of discussion um, in civil society. Society for the 20 years that that has occurred. Um, it's common to often hear people say, well, look, can we just put more people in Mangere, get them out of Mount Eden and into Mangere? I would just say we must be very careful before we advocate that approach. And we can perhaps talk, that, talk about that more in the next section. But um, I, I think it's fair to say a lot of um, suffering has occurred by having um, the detention of asylum seekers being held in a facility that are supposed to be welcoming welcoming people into New Zealand. Police cars turning up to deport failed asylum seekers is very distressing to everybody, um, including uh, refugees who have arrived in New Zealand through the quota system. And, um, you know, the fact that the officials don't like Mangali being called a detention centre, even though it is a detention centre for some asylum seekers, means that we really need to be thinking closely about why we're using euphemisms for when we we are detaining people. Um, we, because they like to call it the accommodation centre rather than the detention centre. Um, asylum seekers can also be released on conditions from Mount Eden. Um, and that again is obviously better than Mount Eden, but the conditions that people are released on are um, inhumane really. People are, are given about $120 a week to survive on. It's just, it's absolutely miserly. And again, um, Amnesty International highlighted that in, in their report. Essentially, New Zealand doesn't want asylum seekers to come here. And um, Lisa, if you just want to put up that press um, release that I found in the archives of the Human Rights Foundation, back in 2002, so this is, you know, in the year that New Zealand welcomed the Tampa refugees, um, which was a wonderful thing for New Zealand to do. And we all know that the politicians of the day, to this day, continue to get kudos for what they did um, to rescue those uh, Tampa refugees. That was great. If you could just go to the top of that page, please, Lisa. Um, in that same context, the um, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade, if you could just go up, please, which was Phil Goff at the time, was responsible for um, issuing um, pamphlets and leaflets around the ports that refugees um, would be in before coming to New Zealand, such as Kuala Lumpur, um, uh, Bangkok, um, and so on. And if you just go down to the second page, um, it said very clearly in those leaflets, it was saying to uh, people, do not seek to try and come to New Zealand. Um, even if you do make it at the top there, even if you do make it, New Zealand provides for those arriving illegally to be detained. You face that prospect while your asylum claim is processed 
most claims made in New Zealand fail. If your claim fails, you will be sent home. Um, and it's very important to understand that, that a real drive of that immigration officials want to detain people um, when they arrive at the border is because it means the person are, are, remains in what is called the turnaround provisions of the Immigration Act, which means that if their claim is declined, they can be deported straight back to the last port of embarkation, which means that these people are at the highest risk of reform or uh, return to a place of harm than anybody else in our system. So I hope that provides an overview of um, the New Zealand context and why it is so important um, that the Amnesty International report has been picked up by the Associate Minister of Immigration. We now have a review and we can talk um, in this next section about uh, where to next. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah, and thank you for so um, clearly and strongly setting out that human rights uh, framework and adding the um, insights from your um, expertise and experience and practice in terms of what that means for people as they go through that practice. So I'm going to now put uh, one last question to our panellists before we open up for questions and can have a more general chat. And just as Deborah said, this is uh, moving on to, so what's the future we want to see and the change we want to see in this space? Uh, Bernard, I'll hand back over to you. Yes, sorry, my mic was on mute. <laughs> Not very unusual for this kind of online forum. Yeah, thank you so much, Lisa, and thanks to everyone who's here um, today and for this important um, career. Um, and also want to thank our panelists, Deborah and the other one for, for yeah, having part in this conversation. Yeah, what next for us or what is the option going forward? You know, as people who have gone through this process, we think the right way. First, the first thing that I want to make clear here is that for many of us who come here, perhaps, and in some instances, not uh, having the right travel paper, not that we don't want, but more because of we are living a regime or a system that would not even give us those papers. It, you know, it's it, um, not possible to, to, to go to the same government that is persecuting you to ask for a ID card or a, a travel paper to be able to leave the country. So when we do embark on that journey, we, we have some expectations from what we see in other parts of the world that it's likely that we can But what we don't um, really expect is to be put in prison. So for us, ideally, our expectation is that if, if that is the reason why we should be detained because our ID cards, you know, our identity is being investigated, it should happen in the community. That would be the best. And by community, what I mean is there are several, several ways as, you know, as a government that have developed ways that they could restrict people's freedom. Whether it could be that we, we have a system where we always go back to report, to, to immigration or to the police to ensure that we're keeping to that um, uh, conditions that respect, uh, restrict our movement. And for instance, currently during the um, COVID-19 uh, pand uh, pandemic, um, since the, the pandemic started, some of the asylum seekers, if not all but one, that were detained at Mount Eden prison were released to the organization that I'm, I'm the chair for, the Asylum Seekers Support Trust. And during this time, there were a few occasions that I went to the trust to, to be able to, 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 to drive these people to town so that they can sign into the city, so that they can sign with Immigration New Zealand and they have to do this once every week. So I used to go in. And during this period until, you know, even to, today that we speak, those that are under that condition, if there are any still there, no one has escaped or run away from, you know, Auckland to other parts of the country. So clearly we have systems that can work with, with minimal risk if people are, um, are detained in the community while their identity or other issues are being investigated than um, in, in a prison facility. Yeah. 
and and by community. I don't like Deborah said. I would not endorse uh, Mangri as part of that community because there are just so many reasons that it's 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 not safe. Personally, I have gone into Mangri many times to support asylum seekers that have been there, being detained that were from um, um, Africa and from countries that I know, and there is the the way they are treated as asylum seekers, it's quite different from how the convention uh, quota refugees are treated. And for many, that can be very, that was really very um, torturing looking or very um, dehumanizing would be the better word to, to see how, you know, one category of refugees get treated so well and then they get treated very poorly and do not have the privilege to assess the, the services. So ideally it would be some kind of community detention, not the Mangari center would be best. That's for me, that's good for me. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard. Yes. Can I just I hand over to you now, Yulia, for a few comments. Is that working? Are you having trouble unmuting? Mm -hmm. so, uh, okay, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Um, again, I think that the points uh, my presence of both Bernard and uh, Deborah uh, mentioned are very important. Especially, I think that one of the things that it is questionable why there is such a different treatment and access to rights when it comes to uh, uh, so-called uh, quota refugees and convention refugees on one hand and also then uh, asylum seekers. So I think that this is one thing uh, that it should be a part of a, a larger uh, debate as well because um, if you follow the refugee convention, uh, the this kind of... Uh, inequality between these groups should not be appearing. So I think that's one of my comments that I wanted to add here, but I'm happy to discuss this more. Thank you, Yulia. And Deborah, handing over to you now. Thank you. Um, I, think I've, I think the best starting point about where New Zealand should go is the UNHCR guidelines of 2012 regarding asylum seekers in detention. So the UNHCR, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees is the United Nations body that's the guardian of the convention. And they produce guidelines and um, all sorts of materials to state parties in terms of how they should meet their obligations under the refugee convention. And I'll just put in the chat box. So these that, um, yeah, they have a number of suggestions about alternatives to detention. Um, just before I get to that, though, in terms of where we're at now, as a result, really, of civil society advocacy, including Amnesty International, um, there is now a, a, a review going on by Victoria KCQC into the, the detention of asylum seekers in New Zealand. And it has a terms of reference, and um, the, the, the review is currently occurring and it should be out in the next few months and it's quite a wide-ranging review where it's looking at basically doing a stock take and making recommendations for the future um, and so a, a number of us um, is, have all been part of this and I uh, think that uh, lawyers have been strongly advocating for and I'm sure civil society is the UNHCR 2012 guidelines um, where there are a number of alternatives to detention set out in those guidelines um, that say that say the starting point is actually that asylum seekers or refugee claimants should not be detained, um, and it should that detention should only occur where there are legitimate security, public health issues for detention, um, and that uh, we need to be able to look for um, uh, ways to manage. Uh, the situation is the least infringement on liberties. Um, so one one way of doing that is, I think, to be really um, increasing the role of NGOs, a civil society, 
um, in terms of having reception um, centres or hostels available. We've got the Asylum Seekers Trust hostel. We need to be looking at increasing the capacity, increasing the security of funding. Um, for people on the call here, um, you know, have a think about if you want to be supporting the work of NGOs in this space more. Um, sometimes, you know, I know that as lawyers, we are often looking for people to um, take people into their homes if they've got a spare bedroom or a spare studio or, or whatever, um, because that, that could be a, a residence that where there could be a reporting condition, the person has to go to a police station weekly. For the last 20 years, we've basically been stuck because we've been bouncing between the Department of Corrections and the Immigration Service, where they say, we know that prison isn't the best place, but there aren't enough people to build a special facility. And so basically there has just been absolute inertia by the ministers and the public service in that regard, um, and a total lack of imagination. Um, we now have an opportunity to be looking at alternatives. And so I would really encourage people to look at our guidelines. Annex A, I've just put it in the chat box, has the suggestions. It's, it's looking at what happens, for example, in the UK and Australia. Um, New Zealand is absolutely lagging behind the rest of the world. Um, so we do have the opportunity for change if Victoria Casey recommends it. But then if she does make those recommendations, we need to make sure that the politicians and cabinet actually take them up. And it's not just for the Minister of Immigration, it's also um, Minister of Corrections as well, um, and to ensure that there's proper funding. And even in this rare circumstance where asylum seekers may need to be detained, we need to make sure that they are not being detained in the hellhole of Mount Eden, um, where there's inadequate access to medical services, access to counsel, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, th this is a, a really scurrilous, dirty um, secret of New Zealand that we really need to, um, you know, clean up once and for all. And we do have that opportunity with this Casey review. So we, when you hear of it coming out, please check the recommendations. Um, fingers crossed the recommendations are going to be helpful. And then just please use your um power of any organisations you're in or to support organisations to get some political will to implement them. Thank you. Thank you. Just before um, going into questions uh, from the audience, which I have a number, I know that there's lots of um, things people want to um, ask you and get your insights and knowledge on. But one of the things that came through quite strongly, I think, from, from all of you um, on the panel was, I guess, thinking about the wider narratives, including um, systemic racism and how the, and you talked about the, the deterrence policy and you, Larry, I think you talked about that, um, the treating asylum, seeking, as, asylum seekers as if it's a criminal act and really looking at how that narrative is at play there and that almost came out um, quite explicitly in the um, document that Deborah asked me to, to show. And I'm just wondering what reflections you have about that and how that is hindering change. I'm wondering if I could um, start Bernard. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very um, good question. And for me, this sort of leads me to my, uh, to some of the, the data that I'm uncovering in my thesis. Uh, what, what I see there is that it's, it's a culture, you know, and it's, it, because this narrative starts, you know, or started from, from the politicians, then it, it fed into other government departments. So when we are here as asylum seekers, we just turn to experience um, obstacles or problems at each government department that we go to. So it, it's that culture that has started from the, 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 the politicians. And if you look for instance from that um, uh, extract which you put out, a while ago from Deborah, that was in 2002. Around 2009, we, uh, to, sorry, 2013, we had a similar kind of discussion on when um, the government was about to change to introduce this um, provision on the amendment to the detention of people who might come in, in, in numbers of up to about 30 or more. Please Deborah, correct, correct, Deborah, correct me on that if I'm wrong. 
since it's, a, it's an issue of it's issue with the law. But we have this mass amendment act to the immigration. But what was quite um, um, very damaging to us from this background is the kind of language that was used in parliament at the time by the politicians at the time. You know, we will we'll call names, you know, that uh, whether it's queer jumpers in, and this kind of language, I believe it fits into other government departments such that when we are recognized, for instance, say we, we move past the prison situation, you, you, you have a recognition letter, or I have, a, I have a recognition letter that says that I'm a refugee, then I go to a government department like a work and income because I couldn't get a job to apply for um, income support. You, you, you immediately we face these obstacles. Or so even after we recognize, it takes a year, currently even more than a year, to to be granted a permanent residence. And then even moving be, uh, uh, beyond that, if you look at how children for for people that are have come here as asylum seekers, for instance, like me, I have a, uh, the recognition and brought my children over. When I applied for student allowance and student loan, and this is quite interesting where you can really see that culture, how it affects. When I applied for student allowance and student loan, because I had had a look at the policy online, it says, um, by studying, it says, um, refugees and protected person who have permanent residence can apply for student allowance and student loan. So they don't have to, currently we have a policy that says in order to get that, um, student loan and, or student allowance. If you have come to New Zealand as a, uh, an ordinary migrant, say for instance, a skilled migrant, you will have to wait for three years before you can assess that. But if you are a refugee or a protected person with a permanent resident visa, you don't have to wait for three years. Or if you have been sponsored into New Zealand by someone who had a refugee status or protected, or st uh, protected person status, you also don't have to wait to, for three years. So then going by that, I then applied for student allowance for my children because they got here in 2019. And I was shocked that even though the, the, the residence visa for my children were granted on the basis that I had refugee status in New Zealand because I had to establish that when I was applying for the resident visa, when it came to applying for student allowance and student loan, it was declined that I was being treated in the system as uh, they were being treated, or I was being treated in the system. As, so the category which they came in was seen as um, a migrant, ordinary migrant. So they were not seen, they did not have that benefit as you know, children of, of a refugee in New Zealand. But at the same time, we had like the Tertiary Education Commission, which runs the government fee free, uh, fee free scheme. That is the one year that the government gives to students in New Zealand who want to start tertiary education to be able to get free education for that one year without paying fees. The tertiary education, uh, tertiary education commission sort of have the same policy as study link and they were able to approve the fee free, fees free for my children Without any problem, the one it was approved, I just had to do a statutory declaration and attach my refugee status recognition later. But then I was shocked that a student allowance, a study link, for instance, used to approve that and decline despite the appeal and all the way to the um, student allowance appeal authority, it was declined. So what I see here is that it's this culture that starts with the politicians and then some government departments Dictate, and then they just look at people from convention refugee background. I want to be clear here, not quota refugees, convention refugees background. Once you have any paper that shows that you had to have to claim refugee status in Islam before you recognize you were treated in a very appalling way, I would say. You, you just, we tend to face obstacles with this different government department. And it's quite different. It's quite difficult to, to sort of navigate them except for someone who's been lucky to be connected to an organization like the Asylum Seeker Support Trust or any other organizations in the country like Change Makers in Wellington or some of the work that um, 
uh, our students at um, either Auckland Law students at the University of Auckland or Wellington University do in terms of that advocacy that they might be able to support. But other than that, that culture just fits around everywhere and it, it makes life really tough and difficult for people from conventional refugee background. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yes. Deborah or Julia, was there something, anything you wanted to add in there? I know, um, Deborah, you would have seen these issues in your practice, and Julia, I know you've commented on it. Particularly yeah, in your I mean, I, I've seen some of the questions in the chat just talking about what, what are the drivers of this deterrence policy, and essentially the issue of immigration is one of the last areas of national sovereignty for governments, um, deciding who does come in and out of our borders and so um you know people don't give up power easily governments don't want to give up power and so being able to patrol those borders and govern those borders is, is kind of the heart of executive power that's that's what's going on in terms of um the the nation state and, and um you know i think there is a really interesting question that uh, with just starting see, to see the beginnings of conversations about which I really welcome, which is well, what is the role of the Treaty of Waitangi in immigration policy and in refugee policy, welcoming Manahiri and vulnerable visitors? Um, you know, we need to have wider conversations as a country about what is our population policy? What, who, who do we want to welcome into New Zealand and greet and what values um, do we value as a country? Um, how do we weigh up um, investors and entrepreneurs with reuniting families with the refugee communities? These are all kind of deeper questions which we haven't had as a country and which politicians certainly um, aren't having with us. And I think that we've actually got these drivers that are really invisible, if you like, to, um, to us as um, the populace which is that New Zealand is part of the five eyes. We're part of, if you like, um, the Western fortress state. We um, hang out in the playground with Australia and Canada. I, I often think in this issue of like a children's playground and those are the five kids hanging around and New Zealand's like the little kid trying to, you know, show that they're just as important as the others. And something you often hear officials talking about and judges with all due respect to our judiciary, but I, I do know that um, politicians and officials and judges like to say that New Zealand has a refugee problem, just like the UK or just like Australia. And um, when you look at the statistics and the numbers, New Zealand is in such a different um, ball game to those other nation states. And um, there's a story that I, I often tell, and forgive me for those who've heard this before, but 20 years ago, um, after the 9-11 um, policy that where asylum seekers were being wholesale detained, a, a case was taken with Rodney Harrison QC and, and myself and the Refugee Council of New Zealand. And we were down at the Court of Appeal trying to argue against the wholesale detention of asylum seekers. And um, the, the bench said at, at, at the time, a number of times that them across the road, meaning the politicians and the beehive, wouldn't be happy with them if they gave us what we were advocating, which I always found strange as a, as a young lawyer, why members of the judiciary were so clearly voicing their concerns at the executive being unhappy about them um, exercising uh, a decision in favour of, of our human rights argument. But something that we also heard constantly down at the High Court and in the Court of Appeal was this concern about floodgates um, and New Zealand's refugee problem. So I went and um, crunched some numbers overnight to see, well, what were New Zealand's numbers compared to the UK? And so at that time, we were getting uh, something like 800 refugees a year. Now it's about 400 a year. We, we get a lot less um, refugees because of our successful deterrence policy. Um, and so at that time, we, New Zealand would get in one year, asylum seekers, what the UK would get before morning tea on a Monday morning of one day a year. But yet New Zealand was still equating ourselves with um, our, these overseas partners. 
And so I think it's also, you know, helpful when when talking to politicians and talking to others in the community to just put New Zealand in perspective. We're at the bottom of the world. We have um, far less people coming. And I'm not saying that that's good or bad. I'm just saying that is our political reality. Um, and, you know, we don't have this floodgates problem. And New Zealand is also the most one of the most least generous states in terms of our quota programme. Um, Australia, for all of its sins, um, and we love to say we're better than Australia, but, you know, you look at the numbers that the Australians take in on their quota programme. You know, New Zealand takes a fraction per um, capita than Australia. So, you know, I, I, it's a complex picture. New Zealand, we love to look really good on the international stage. We love to sort of remind everybody about Tampa and so on. But just remember, at the same time as Tampa, the same government was putting out brochures telling refugees not to come here or we would lock them up. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Yulia, do you want to also... Yes, I think that what Deborah highlighted about the sovereignty of the states and how many states are unwilling to give up this somehow last bastion of sovereignty, who has the right to come to somebody's, uh, to some state's border and so on. I think this is a very, very uh, important thing that she uh, highlighted. I would also add, however, that basically protecting people who are seeking asylum uh, is one of the last and most essential uh, tests of uh, humanity and whether a state does abide by universal declaration of human rights or it doesn't. I mean, I think that we need to remember that uh, as well and uh, also think about um, how to go from that. So on one hand, yes, Sovereignty, this is something what politicians usually say, sovereignty and security. These are the two things that uh, are constantly being mentioned. But also we need to question the other side uh, and how much uh, uh, do uh, states abide by this uh, uh, ultimate test of humanity. And I also wanted to add, I saw in the comments about uh, questions about uh, comments about systemic racism, which I absolutely agree uh, with. And we saw this just recently how quickly we get a backlash uh, when there was this uh, attack by somebody who used to be a former asylum seeker and all of a sudden we saw a backlash why do we want to give rights to asylum seekers as if all the asylum seekers would do a similar act which is really problematic and it's constantly being repeated in certain uh, respects to like uh, just projecting to the entire community and uh, of course in the background there is a bigger question how do we imagine the future uh, future uh, immigration system here because it seems to me that this uh, um, system is still predominantly uh, uh, governed by the crown but not by uh, for example by uh, maori and so on yes and i think as i'm um, picking up on on what that comment was saying as well that um this is really just highlighting the structural issues that are impacting um, many different groups and communities across the board and so what can we be doing um, and which in, which is also which is about the conversation the Tashiti conversation to be making those wholesale structural changes so this isn't happening or these types of structural issues that we're seeing in the criminal justice system just aren't happening. I want to now um, just move on to I'm just aware of time and I know that there are lots of um, questions coming in so I'm just going to move to the public questions and the first one up that I know um, I'm sure many on our panel are going to have um, comments on and certainly um, there are certainly things that we can say too is about how how transparent have people found Immigration New Zealand decision making processes and what is the point of an appeal so I guess that's looking at um, how effective that process is. Um, Deborah, do you want to take that one first? Um, yeah, sure, happy to. Um, well, mm, I'm not quite sure. Uh, I'll have a go at answering it. So how transparent are immigration decisions? Uh, I'm not sure transparency is the issue here. Um, the issue in terms of detention is about being able to have um, independent judicial oversight um, of immigration decisions that's effective. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I don't think there's issues to do with um, 
information being hid or in anything like that. Um, and in terms of appeals, um, if we're talking about the refugee status decision process, we've got the Immigration Protection Tribunal, which is an independent tribunal, and I would say provides an effective appeal mechanism. So, yeah. I mean, I, I do think the, the number one change that really needs to occur is for there to be meaningful access to justice for asylum seekers to challenge conditions, um, the, the detention decision and the conditions of detention. Um, one point that is on my mind is that, um, you know, I don't know what the future looks like with um, the COVID border and asylum seekers even being able to arrive in New Zealand anymore, frankly. Um, you know, the numbers have been steadily going down because over the last, I don't know, five or ten years, border claims have really reduced. The people who were able to get into New Zealand and claim asylum were people able to come in under other categories, namely student categories or on work visas and so on. Um, but, you know, I, I think there's, there's, it's going to be a lot harder for people to be able to come to New Zealand to claim asylum. I, I, I think that door's almost shut now. Um, and so it, it may be really important for attention to be uh, harnessed in terms of um, the quota and upping New Zealand's obligations under that quota. Just, just a thought. Deborah, do you also see a problem? So with this, um, it's a problem when you're imprisoning people seeking asylum as well, is that the issue sort of can bounce a bit between immigration and obviously corrections. Uh, what issues does that create in terms of understanding what's happening? Yeah, I mean, it is absolutely shocking um, in terms of the conditions of detention for asylum seekers and how difficult it is for um, asylum uh, for claimants and their lawyers to actually access their rights. Um, you know, there's basically no services at all, psychological services for victims of torture, for example, nothing. Um, and, you know, immigration experimented with having a welfare officer. And so um, I gave them a chance for a client who was, um, had been in Woody Women's Prison, you know, which we all know has, you know, been found out had the most shocking conditions. And so, um, my client had their meeting with the welfare officer to explain how she wasn't having drinking water and had been locked down 23 hours a day and so on. And so immigration's response to that, their welfare officer, was they sent an email to corrections and didn't get anywhere. And they were basically like, what do you want me to do? They're not responding to my emails. You know, like it is just it's absolutely ineffective, these two organisations that just bounce people between each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bernard or Yulia, did you have any comments to add to that? Uh, no, thank you. Uh, on, yeah. And there's another question that's come through, and Deborah, you almost, um, well, you touched on a little bit, was the impact of COVID. And I guess looking forward in the next, um, knowing the impact COVID's having now and looking forward in the next five years, even a decade, what sort of challenges that we foresee coming up because of that? Bernard, do you have any thoughts on that question? Yes, like um, as uh, Deborah highlighted before, it's it's going to be more and more tough for um, people from uh, asylum background or refugee background to be able to make it to this country. And just in terms of, if I may add a, a bit more flesh to that, is it there is something that our GM at um, the Asylum Seekers Support Trust always say every time, you know, when he speaks, he says that um, New Zealand actually spends um, about 8 million overseas somewhere in Southeast Asia along the Indonesian coast and all those countries are along there trying to stop boats to get to New Zealand. Whereas in, in the country here, we spend just about 4 million or so or more to resettle refugees. So that sort of tells us, you know, where the focus of the government is. It's actually trying to stop people to come here. And besides that, we also have this um, advanced um, passenger screening system that we use, which is quite effective in stopping any person. You know, if you look, just this is more so as um, a personal experience and many people that look like me travel to New Zealand is that if you're coming to New Zealand and you look like me and you go a visa, the, the, your last flight before you bought that plane to come to New Zealand, the screening that you go through, it's 
very different from everyone else. Like I was put out of the, the queue and asked to sit there while every other person. So this kind of every other person goes through into the plane. But this kind of policies that we use, they work very effective to stop people from getting here. But what that means is that we, you know, with this COVID and the introduction of the vaccine passport, it's going to make it even much more harder for um, people from refugee backgrounds to get here. More especially that if we are thinking about the fact that more and more the people that claim asylum are those that come as students or with work visas. For many people from African background, for instance, or perhaps even in the Middle East, where that is where the, the bulk of the world's refugee, for instance, in Africa in particular, majority, I don't know, maybe three quarters of people that are in refugee situation will be there. They don't have that means to, to apply for it for a student visa because you have to put so much money in, in you have to show that you have so much money to be able to pay your fees, to be able mm -hmm. to get to New Zealand. That's uh, one point. Another second point is that even if you apply for a, a work visa, the screening that we have to go through if you're on the African continent or Africa in another part of the world, it's exceptionally tough to be able to get a visa. You're really exceptionally lucky to be approved a visa. So all these things going forward would mean that it would just be um, very difficult for people who are in refugee-like situation or refugees in other parts of the world and highly marginalized, marginalized and needing to get out. It would make it really, really difficult for them to get to, uh, to a country like New Zealand, especially in, in the COVID atmosphere. Yeah, you yeah. would be quite interesting to hear your your thoughts on this as well. The ammunition happening again. I'll just check. There you go. Yeah. Uh, sorry, could you repeat your question? It's like a question I couldn't hear you. So just looking at the, um, just reflecting on the impact of COVID and the impact that it's having currently and also looking forward to possible impacts and challenges it might throw up looking five years, 10 years ahead, the types of uh, issues that might come from that. So um, I might play a little bit of devil's advocate uh, here to just say something else that we could the fact that the borders are closed is devastating on one hand for many, many people because many families are separated and people, especially for asylum seekers and also uh, people who already have a refugee status to get to a safe place has been really, really uh, minimized and decreased. So very much more narrowed in the world politics. On the other hand, what I'm thinking is that now, given that uh, there are very few asylum seekers in, in New Zealand. So it's really problematic that the treatment is as it is because there has never ever, as Deborah has uh, also highlighted the numbers, there have never been a big number of asylum seekers or big number of uh, quota refugees even in New Zealand. So uh, given that the border is so closed, there is an opportunity right now to say and actually correct this injustice. So correct the injustice for people who are already here and are faced because uh, faced with uh, quite dire conditions as uh, both uh, Deborah and Bernard have uh, have highlighted. So basically uh, to first, like let, let's think about of the people who are here uh, that they shouldn't be going to this kind of conditions and such a discrimination and injustice also in comparison to some uh, uh, other migrant uh, categories. So that's the first thing. The second thing we will really need to think about the future and how to actually protect people who uh, who are fleeing from persecution because at the moment the system where sovereignty of states comes prefer before uh, actually protection of life of people it is quite problematic it is endangering uh, lives of many people so this is my very like how should I say abstract comment but I think that this needs to be addressed. Sorry, as I'm moderating, you think I would know to turn my mute off before I talk. Uh, another question that's come through, and I think this is reflecting on um, just how long it's taken to get here, uh, decades, and and why that is. Deborah, well, why that might be. 
and we've already touched on some of the reasons that might be. It's a, quite a big question, um, but any reflections there? No, no, no. It's it's uh, yeah. I'm happy to give my um, reflections there, bearing in mind this is being recorded, so I will still be somewhat diplomatic. Um, there has been absolute resistance from from certain senior officials within Immigration New Zealand who are die-hard adherents of the deterrence policy. Um, and we have immigration ministers and the Minister of Corrections where, who are busy, other portfolios and their officials aren't raising it. You know, it's, I would say this is because of the public service and senior officials um, mandarins of the of immigration New Zealand who have wanted to serve this deterrence policy um, as part of their obligations to state sovereignty and being part of the five eyes that's what I would say and that the the politicians um, have allowed essentially the officials to um, run this um, and it also serves the politicians in interests to be um, consistent with the policy of the Five Eyes, as I've already pointed out, um, regarding um, what was happening at the same time as the Tampa. We also had, um, you know, deterrence and we had the Ahmed Zawi case all happening at the same time. So, yeah, that's why it's taken so long. The politicians haven't wanted to do anything. But what why things have changed now is because um, uh, Amnesty did a very effective of report and I think we um, have a, a, a good Associate Minister of Immigration. Simple as that. Thank you. Bernard, do you have any thoughts you wanted to share on that? Or Yulia? So I think um, another question that has come Another question that has come through is about um, the, I guess it's looking at the responsiveness of Immigration New Zealand and the ability to get justice for those that need it. And I think this is, I guess, really talking to access to justice issues and the ability to navigate the system and get the help uh, and support that's needed when it's needed. Deborah, this might be, be suited to you. What's your reflections on the challenges with access to justice? And certainly in the report, there were uh, a series of um, issues that we raised. You're just on mute there. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I know that nobody ever likes lawyers talking about funding problems, um, but that is just the reality. Re refugee lawyers are, are, are the lowliest paid in the entire legal system because the determination system isn't held in a district court or above, it's in a tribunal or the immigration service. So we're in the lowest quadrant and the rates haven't gone up for nearly 15 years, I think, whereas all the other expenses have gone up. Um, and so that's, that's a really systemic problem and there is just a lack of funding, adequate funding at all really, to take on detention issues and so um, and to take on a, a legal case at the district court is, you know, it, co it costs a lot of time and money mm -hmm. and then even if you do get there, even if you do decide, right, I'm doing this pro bono, I'm going to turn up and do it, then you, you come up against the um, immigration service lawyers who've got all that institutional knowledge. And then even if you manage to combat that, then you come up against a bench that isn't informed and um, frankly tends to, you know, lean with um, the establishment. And so we need to have a judiciary that is properly educated in the normative human rights framework in refugee law and the detention of asylum seekers. We do not have that at the district court. They're too busy dealing with criminal matters. Um, and Yulia spoke about crimmigration. I mean, I think we need a crimmigration um, court in the district court. Uh, judges who are specialised and understand immigration and refugee law because they just don't. They're time poor. They're busy. 
Um, they, they don't, they're not confident and we need to have um, funding for claimants to be able to have lawyers to represent them. Um, and a lot of this trouble will be, um, you know, assisted by having that access to justice. Thank you. Did any of the other panelists want to add anything to that question? Yeah, I think I might add something to the access um, of justice or access to justice point. Uh, one other um, important point where um, refugee status claimants, um, asylum seekers, it would be quite important for us to get access to justice is at the airport or at the border because for, for many claimants or those who do make a claim at the border, they are not given access to a lawyer, to a lawyer at that stage. And it's a very um, problematic issue because for many people, they will lose their claim at that stage. Because if you would imagine for someone who's traveled from, there is, uh, who's traveled, let's say from Asia, from a direct flight, say from um, Qatar or Dubai, straight to New Zealand, about 16 hours of being on a plane. And you get off that plane and they walk up to the counter, you tell an immigration officer that I'm here, I am here to claim asylum. You've been on a long flight, really tired, nervous, scared, you know, everyone else in the country looks different to you. And then they take you into an interview room and straight up, you would have an interview for like four hours on the reason why you are here and why you're making the claim without a lawyer. And often because people have come through the background where they have gone through uh, people smugglers or traffickers, they may have stories that have already been pre-arranged for them to say. But often these stories, while these stories might work in other contexts, but for New Zealand, they don't, they would not, they would not go through. So not having a lawyer that can actually really advise a person and tell them about their rights, for instance, they don't guide them on what this process means. It simply means many of the claimants just will lose their claim at that stage because anything that you say, the person says at this stage, subsequently, when they go to the um, IRSU, the refugee status branch, that is Immigration New Zealand, interview, all those things that were said at the airport, will be brought against them. And for many people, many refugee status claimants, when you are at the airport, all you just want to do is get into the country. So you think, oh, at this stage, I can say anything or everything that will let me into the country. But you're not thinking that once you get to the refugee status branch interview or subsequently an appeal interview, all those things that were said at the airport will be brought against you. And that also, it's a big contributor of why people do end up in detention, but because, because they never had a lawyer there to support them or to even advocate or sort of have you know a fight, you know, legally, not physically, but you know, uh, argue with the detention officer. For instance, we have cases where people have had the ID cards to prove who they are, but they still end up in detention in prison because the immigration officer maybe just didn't like this person. Or sometimes these interviews at the border is done by people who are not trained as refugee and protection officer. It could just be an immigration officer. Even though our law, if you look at the Immigration Act, it stated quite clearly that you cannot be an immigration officer and as well be a refugee and protection officer. So the, the designations are quite clear and distinct. You can't be the board because of the biases that you may have. But still, in a country like New Zealand, we have cases where people would come at the border and are being interviewed. That four hours interview or three or half a day interview will be conducted by a, a refugee and protection officer or maybe in some cases even a customs officer to some extent. And with all the biases that they have, because remember, these people are trained to protect our borders, not to, to, to look at refugee status claim. So I think yeah, access to justice at the border, sorry, to a lawyer at that border stage, it's very crucial for, for this process, yeah. 
Thank you. We've still got uh, lots of questions coming through, but we are running out of time. So I just wanted to say to everyone, if your question hasn't uh, been able to be answered, do feel free to send it, us, uh, into it to us at Amnesty. We'll endeavour to get it answered. But um, I guess as a final question, quite a few have come around the review, uh, just asking about whether or not the review's uh, recommendations will be binding. So they won't be binding, um, but we strongly hope that um, they uh, um, are as such that show this practice is contrary to international standards and that as a result, the government takes the steps that it needs to, which is to end the practice. And I just want to tie that into... Uh, another question that a lot of people have come through and just to ask each of the panelists is that what is the is what is the what are the, some of the things that people can do to try and help get um, this change over the line so that when the review comes out even though the recommendations aren't binding uh, what can we do to uh, en encourage and, and really compel the government to make this change um, so Bernard I might start with you again on that one yes I think during this beautiful work that um, Amnesty International is doing, I believe when the review will, will be out, I'm guessing that by that time Amnesty International will have some directions, you know, as we did with um, getting us to the stage where we even can now talk about a review. So yeah, join the work that Amnesty International does, that would be good. Would be good. Join um, other uh, civil societies, especially like the Asylum Seeker Support Trust or change makers in Wellington and and so that we can have a stronger voice because that's what helped to get us to this stage. The more we are together and stronger on this, we'll be able to push the government to take action on that. Thank you, Bernard. And Yulia? Well, it's very difficult always to say some uh, last words. I think it's really important to get the ball moving now because as has been highlighted, uh, by all the speakers and many questions in the chat is that the practice of imprisoning asylum seeker is appalling. I think that's the first thing to uh, say. But uh, in the long run, we will also need to think about uh, uh, things on what the immigration system is built in, um, in New Zealand uh, and how to actually bring it forward that it's not anymore as exclusive and, for example, security driven to such, such extent uh, and also like security being actually dressed up racism. And I'll maybe like to conclude here. Thanks, Julian. Deeper. Yeah, good question. Um, so I think, uh, as Bernard said, you know, get in contact with organizations who are supporting this, but, you know, New Zealand is still small enough that contacting your local member of parliament matters. Their electorate secretaries do pay attention and they do let, you know, the members of parliament know, you know, or we've received a few phone calls about this or a few emails about this. Email the associate minister and the minister of immigration as well to um, give your support. Those, those individual emails, they are, they are they noticed? Um, so it, it does make a difference. So I would just really encourage that really simple bit of local activism of let your MP know, no matter what stripe they are, and also, um, you know, write definitely to the Associate Minister and the Minister of Immigration, and I suppose to anybody else in Cabinet. Um, David Parker is, um, you know, quite, um, has quite a lot of uh, influence in Cabinet on legal matters for example um yeah so that's that's what i would suggest that you can do as a matter of practicality and up here in auckland um you know really do be in touch with your asylum seekers trust in particular um to offer support and even if you've got you know um i don't know accommodation available see if you can be part of um you know options for them <clears throat> to help people in need thank you thank you deborah so it's about time to wrap up now. So I'm just going to give our panelists one last chance if there's one takeaway that they wanted to um, provide. Yulia, was there a takeaway you wanted to give? I think I, I concluded before. I would rather, like other people, also 
speak. Deborah, was there anything else you wanted to add? <sighs> well, that um, the starting point has to be New Zealand's obligations under the Refugee Convention, and we should be following what the UNHCR has to say on this issue, that New Zealand is behind our neighbours, that we like, we've got great window dressing, but actually what's happening at home isn't matching up to what we've got in our shop window, and that we have to have honest conversations about it, and we have to keep the politicians of the day, even though they're very popular, we have to keep it real and be honest about what's happening. And Bernard. Yes. Um, the, the one thing I would like to add is that first to thank everyone who's here um, today and um, more especially Amnesty International for, for bringing us here. For me, it was quite um, very shocking when I, when we went to, Lisa, when we went to, when we were in front of um, Mount Eden prison and we we're carrying those placards, uh, I think it was in June, June or July, somewhere about there, um, protesting when this issue was just um, about, before we went to see the minister. One, one of the participants who was um, with us there said, 30 years ago, she was at that same, they had a similar kind of protests on the, uh, on the detention of asylum seekers. So she said she cannot believe that, you know, 30 years was still doing the same thing with nothing that has changed. So I was quite relieved and um, impressed that we are able to, with, with the work that Amnesty International has done and, and the Asylum Seeker Support Trust be, being part of it, um, we've been able to get the movement to this point. So on that note, I think it's, it's worth to, to thank the, the, the government for listening to to this extent, but there is more work that needs to be done to be able to treat um, many people like me. And when when I say like me, I don't mean necessarily black. I mean, people that have come through this pathway of seeking asylum in a way that we feel that we are humans. Because there is a, 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 a quotation, um, some words that one of my research participants used when I interviewed her about her experience of claiming asylum. And that has stopped in my head for over two years, two years now. She said, treat us as humans, not as baboons. And you, you could see, and this is someone, she was not, no, she was detained at the Mangri Refugee Center. And if I may even dis disclose it, she was one of Deborah's clients. And it, it was, you know, shocking for me that, um, she was able to, to, to sort of be able to look at how the process treats asylum seekers in terms of um, um, to the point where they, it, it just gets the feeling that we are not being treated as humans. As humans. So a change in, in the system is not enough for New Zealand to go to the rest of the world and try to portray this image, you know, optics that we respect human rights, we do all these things. Um, another lawyer even described it as well that it's like a, a, when you are outside you look at New Zealand it's like a, a glossary is it glossary? you know it's it's like this beautiful thing that you're seeing through a glass and you think oh that's a beautiful country I'll go to but when you arrive to New Zealand and then you meet these happy smiley Kiwis at the airport and you tell them that I'm here to claim asylum they smile at you and they throw you to prison so it's, you know, this, these are the kind of stories that for a country like New Zealand, we should not be having this. And a lot of us here, we, I believe we are advocates, we, we, we believe strongly in this work and we can definitely with the right push and talking to the right people will bring change ultimately. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Bernard, and, and completely echo those words as well, um, that mm -hmm. we can bring about change. Um, I just want to take this opportunity to say a really big thank you 
to the panelists uh, for coming tonight and being so generous with your time. And also thanks to everyone who took the time to come tonight to hear more about this issue. Um, Maggie has posted in the chat the email address if there was a question or issue that you wanted um, to ask that you didn't feel was covered. And also there's a link to the Amnesty petition on this that I really encourage you to sign if you haven't and share. Uh, and it's also where we will post updates uh, when information on the review comes through. So thank you so much, everyone. Um, it was really, once again, thank you to our panellists and it was really uh, interesting insights and great to hear uh, your thoughts on this matter. And yeah, let's get that change over the line. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.